But the problem I think that doesn't get solved or struggles to get solved when those of us who are entrepreneurs in this space try to innovate against it is we forget that, you know, steel on salt water is just nothing but constant problems, right? And you, 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 in order to solve constant problems, you have to talk and human nature requires that you talk, but the, the talking is sophisticated, dynamic, multi-party, and the email is just an available open network to that. And I think one of the problems you have is I don't think no matter how digital native you get with, with attempting to, to improve the efficiency of shipping, too many people ignore the fact that the conversation is part of the commerce. That's the voice of Bill Doby, today's guest on the podcast. Not only do we talk about Bill's start in the industry and how he hopped on the tech bandwagon back in the early 2000s, but where the space is going in general today. One of the more interesting points that Bill made was around blockchain and how that could have actually been a bad thing for our industry. The reason why? It pulled resources away from other ideas that had maybe more tangible solutions. As I always ask, don't forget to follow. This is the plus button on the top of each of your podcasts wherever you get them. This will allow you to be notified when new episodes are dropped. And also, if you like what you hear, please add a five-star review with a few nice words. Thanks for listening. Once again, I'm Chris Aversano, and now on to the show. Welcome, everyone, and you are listening to The Last Dinosaur, and I'm your host, Chris Aversano. On today's podcast, we will have Bill Doby, founder and CEO at Sedna. I'm excited to have Bill on the show as he is someone that started in maritime and then went into the software side of the industry and has worked a long time in the maritime space. Even before all the software, Bill was an agent and broker in shipping, but Bill has been building software since 1984 when he got his first computer, a TI 99 4A. In 2000, he started creating solutions for business critical transactions when he found in Navarick with three friends from university. Bill started Stage 3 Systems in 2010, a company which ran major software services for ship owners, commodity companies, and agents around the world. In 2016, he began working with customers across the supply chain on many of the challenges they faced working with email. This close collaboration led to the creation of Sedna. Sedna is a smart email platform that helps enterprise enterprises in the supply chain and beyond to escape the noise and confusion of traditional email platforms. Full disclosure, my company has a partnership with Sedna. That's Vesson Q88. And Bill, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Chris. Really, really nice to be here. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to get going about this one, especially kind of your long-time collaboration in the shipping industry. So let's talk a little bit about Sedna. Let's talk about, you know, what it yeah. does and kind of where you are today. Uh, because I, I think it's okay. fascinating to hear about kind of where you are today as we talk about, about uh, kind of other things here. Sure. No, I, I mean, it's in, in really simple terms, like a huge part of the, of the shipping industry and the wider supply chain, as you know, runs over email and, and our, you know, there's a lot of uh, approaches and views of whether or not it should be done this way. And we instead kind of lean into the fact that it is this way and, and we try to fix it from within. And in simple terms, what Sedna does is it, it connects the work email streams to a company's core system. So we, as you know, we connect to QDA, eight, connect to Vest and other tools. And we let that information drive our email streams so that fundamentally the customer can, can work faster and, and with less risk. I, 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 was, I was fascinated when I was reading um, about the, the name of the podcast and like that perspective and, and like it's how, how it's, it's quite easy to kind of think our industry is old fashioned or, or backwards. And I think there may be elements of that to it, but I think a lot of the resistance to change comes from the, the risk that a change might create. And, and so Sedna is really, Hey, this is where you work today. You work inside of email. You have these huge volumes, the truth, the context, the action, the reward, the opportunity, all of that sits in kind of plain text in this really poorly managed way. And Sedna is a way to kind of renovate, renew, and, and interact with it. In, in shipping terms, we probably help customers handle about 10,000 voyages a month. We've got users in about 90 countries. We have um, a big office, our, our HQ here in London, a team in Singapore, and, and then about a, a dozen folks or so uh, spread throughout uh, uh, North America. Earlier, we talked, uh, or at least I mentioned in the opening, you you started off in the agency and kind of uh, brokerage side. How did you make that pivot into software uh, and and kind of the, the decision to stay in the maritime side of software? 
Well, I was, I was actually, I was a shipbroker in Vancouver, working mostly Korean tonnage um, that uh, we had a couple of principals who would parcel it down the West Coast and then take copper concentrates back, uh, back to uh, Japan. And I, I, were, I had a great boss, I, I, an operator and uh, a legend in the, in the US shipping industry, a guy named Ed Ellis. And I was living in Seattle at the time. And uh, this was around 2000 when everybody was starting a software company, the first doctor. Uh, the first dot com boom. And I actually interviewed, you, you may know the name, I interviewed with a company called Level Seas, which was like one of these early digital initiatives to, to kind of transform the industry. Uh, but suffice to say, the interview didn't go very well. And partially because I was, I kept arguing with them a bit about what the problem was. They were really fixated on the fixing problem. And I was like, actually, that's kind of a small part of the problem. There's a bunch of data uh, preliminary to that, or well, the voyage is underway, that's kind of much more relevant to optimize. Um, the performance or, or the, the time charter outcome. And you're going to need that data in an organized way in order for this platform to be more efficient. Anyways, I didn't get the job, but I became and continued my kind of obsession with, with uh, you know, software technology. And uh, I had an opportunity working with a ship agent in the US, a company called Transmarine. They were looking to, to build a portal, deal, deal a little bit with some of their email volumes. And at that point, I decided to kind of make the jump. It seemed everybody in Seattle at the time had a software company. So, you know, why not me? And, 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 and I left to that. I like, I like shipping a lot. I accidentally ended up working in it starting in 1995 um, out of an ad in the newspapers, you know, spent time on the ships down at the docks. I found being a broker hard, challenging, and uh, but and I liked being a charter, and I was a charter in a down market, so it was tough, and I, I learned a lot. But I generally thought I love the trust elements, I love the ability to do business with people overseas almost instantly, and to kind of build these relationships and do these really complex, expensive things. But I found the act of assembling or sifting all the different pieces to try to figure out what was going on to be very, very tiring, very, very time consuming. And it was even back then that I began to develop a pretty almost quite stern hypothesis. Like, as you know, in shipping, there's there's very little you can do in the moment to improve the performance of the ship. You can make it safer and, and you can load it faster. You can get it out of port faster or run fuel more efficient. But because all this data comes after the fact, many operators and owners don't have any time to achieve any real digitization. So all these KPIs, all these dashboards, all these post-fact analysis, they don't do any good because the ship has already sailed or something like that. The idea, I, I think I might have read... Um, might have read Bloomberg's book or something, and he was, you know, he had something about the housewives putting all the data uh, for bond spreads in a basement in New Jersey in the '80s. I kind of thought, hey, if we started to like collect this poor call information data, the the, the cargo data going on the ship, and you organized and sifted it, um, could we make the whole market a little more faster and efficient? That was the dream, anyways. So we ended up working like on on something else like all software companies, but but that that's where I got it from. How do you help a harried operator improve the safety and performance of the ship in real time? That That's what I was focused on. And you touched upon this a little bit, you know, has that journey from when you started to where you are today and, and through a couple of different iterations of companies, has that journey been what you thought or has it kind of have you gone on tangents and not in a bad way? I don't want to make that sound like, you know, you're off on a no. tangent, again, you know, but have yeah. you kind of yeah. gone down a path? Yeah. You know, uh, have you gone down a path that maybe was a little unforeseen uh, because it's interesting. I asked that question. I love to ask founders uh, or people who've kind of done this for a while, because sometimes, um, you know, we, we spoke offline, even for me, like, well, what do you want to get out of the podcast personally? And I'm clear. Right. I, 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 this is a creative yeah. outlet. You know, but but even then, it's starting to morph into slightly something a little bit different. Um, for you, where 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 has that kind of, uh, it, you know, where is the path mm -hmm. taking you, and is it different than what you kind of first set out? Not necessarily with Sedna, but even you know, back uh, at the beginning of time with the bubble. Well, beginning of time for you with in the in the software industry with the bubble. I like that question, and not as a stalling tactic do I say that. I, I like that question because if I'm really honest with myself, I think I've been working on the same problem for 20, 25 years, right? Like any sort of programmer, uh, which I was a very long time ago, not, not any good now, I sort of thought, 
you know, I looked at email, I looked at telex, I looked at, at these, you know, my predecessors who I'm now the same age as them. And I thought the way you're doing it is old fashioned. You're a dinosaur and, and you know, there's got to be a better way. Right. And I built a lot of software trying to drive a better way. You know, my, my, old, my very first business uh, Navrick still widely in use is about cargo inspection and built port agency software, built software for building ships, uh, you know, to help, uh, you know, build container ships, things like that. And the whole idea was, you know, why would you be running your business over an academic memoing protocol from the 1970s, which is what email was? You just need a better system. You know, you, you don't go to Starbucks and order your coffee with an email. But what I realized is that every new system beget more communication. Every new system beget more email. And the updates got sent by email, the confirmation that you input the data by email. And I would say that over many years of honestly working hard to install software inside all of these big companies we were talking about, I left kind of unsatisfied sometimes. I realized that I was actually creating more work for the user. I realized that, okay, great. Today, they've got this new system and this piece of workflow that they'll put in will lead up to some benefit for the company as the whole. But meanwhile, that guy or th th that woman turns back to her desk and she starts putting stuff back in folders, in email. She starts trying to figure out what does she need to look at. And it, it, it honestly, it irritates me. And I have to watch my language on here. I, I, I think that that it's quite an enormous waste of time. And, and there is and I began to think there's got to be a better way. And I was given an accidental opportunity with it. Again, um, many years ago, the the Transmarine in, in Houston, they when I, when I renewed the contract with them, they were like, okay, yeah, you can renew with us. We like your software, but you've got to help us with email. And I was like, like any good salesman, I'm like, sure, sure. I, let's take a look at it. And, and that kind of led later on into a big discussion with Glencore, who became our first really big client in Sedna, where they were just like, how do we get it so that our people are not manually filing 1,000, 2,000 emails a day? And it led to a bunch of interesting questions, Chris, like why when everything about our industry is already in ones and zeros, when it's already in a digital format, why are there entire industries and companies that work to pull it out of that digital format and then make it usable in some other way. And, and I began to think about what would it mean to the market and ultimately what would it mean to the user if you could manipulate the content inside of email faster, if you could find what you're looking for and you could stitch it into your, your business process um, much more effortlessly. And, and that's really kind of what, what said they came about. I, I will say, Talk about tangents for meandering. No sane person should build an email company. A far harder problem than I realized when I started this. Like, like you got, there is a reason there's only a few companies doing this. <laughs> Let, let's pivot away from that for a minute. So you built it. When you go in yeah. now, and, and it's interesting because just on a parallel uh, kind of way, you know, I know that... Um, Q88, the position list platform, was built out of the same sort of thing. In other words, there was a need from the industry. There was yeah. always one competitor, but it was like, hey, how can we do this a little bit better, a little bit different? Um, and and it was built, uh, uh, you know, the previous uh, you know, CEO of the company uh, for time where I kind of built it based on, hey, help me with a problem, right? So it was a real right, uh, right. problem that software was built for as opposed to sometimes you find software that's built. It's cool. What's the problem is trying to solve. You can get into a philosophical conversation yeah. around blockchain, right? Well, blockchain is great. What's yeah. it solving? And, 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 and you can figure that yeah. out moving away from that philosophical conversation. Now that you've built it and, and whether or not you want to argue the, the soundness of mind for building it, um, you go into, you go, <laughs> but you did, you did bring up something interesting and that is, especially in our industry, hence the name of the platform, The Last Dinosaur, we still have a tendency to uh, be a little dinosaur-like, uh, uh, although I think it is changing. Yeah. When you go into a company who it has is. who has emails uh, and they still do it the old-fashioned way, maybe print it, you know, they got r rows and rows yeah. of, of files and reams of paper and everything. When you go into a company like that, not the ones that asked you to come in and say, we see what you're doing, we want it, but people who where yeah. where they have that kind of mindset, do you, are you still seeing the, the, the pushback and reaction or are you starting to see that as they get maybe younger operators, people who was described on a previous podcast are more digitally native, where you and I are maybe more digitally immigrants, we were kind of built up 
brought yeah. up on one way, but we've kind of migrated to being more digitally savvy. W- what are you seeing out there in the kind of the real world, in the real uh, environment? There, there's sort of like two questions coming together there. The, the, the challenge you have, I think it makes a lot of sense, digital native or not, for most of the transaction to be, for the truth about the transaction to be digital, right? The facts, where the ship is, the price, the fuel, you know, all that type of stuff. But the problem I think that doesn't get solved or struggles to get solved when those of us who are entrepreneurs in this space try to innovate against it is we forget that, you know, steel on salt water is just nothing but constant problems, right? And you, 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 in order to solve constant problems, you have to talk and human nature requires that you talk, but the, the talking is sophisticated, dynamic, multi-party and email is just an available open network to that. And I think one of the problems you have is I don't think no matter how digital native you get with with attempting to, to improve the efficiency of shipping, too many people ignore the fact that the conversation is part of the commerce and the conversation is necessary for the commerce to occur in an efficient and, and safe way. And so our idea is kind of to merge those two things together. Let's embrace the fact that there's already this kind of open protocol that's 40 years old and, and no one really, people have just kind of given up on and, and you know, even Microsoft's given up on it. You know, they, they want everyone to move to unstructured chat, which is, I think, even worse. Or Gmail kind of wants to sell you ads. But here's this open protocol. Let's connect it to the digital system, the expert system, to Vessin, to, to those types of tools, to Q88. And let's kind of make it easier for the person to be almost fully digital but also to be able to talk with anyone they need to at any point in time fast about what's going wrong or what opportunity they can capture. And and I think think shipping is unique in this, right? Not that other businesses don't have chat and conversation and that type of thing. But if you're, to use the example I was telling you before the the chat, we were talking about Sagawelko, one of our customers in Norway, and the the ship was in four or five ports in China, going through the Middle East, and then then all about um, the UK with dozens of different cargoes and on hundreds of, of consignees and stuff, the level of coordination and counterparty involvement to, to kind of get this plywood from point A to point B, it's just astonishing. And that can't be done in a fully digital system because the person buying that plywood may only need it at that one point in time. And for them, they may be using email and stuff. The the blockchain, we could go down a big rabbit hole there because I, I, it's only because you raised it. I don't think there's been few things worse for the digitization in our business, right? Because it consumed capital and mindshare away from actually solving real problems. And and our idea, Senda's idea, is to solve a real problem. You go around to any operator's desk, any charter's desk, what's one of your problems? Too many expletive emails. (laughs) Okay, so let's begin unpacking that. And then we'll try selling you kind of new tools, kind of the, the approach we take. We take for granted how easy and effortless the global ocean supply chain is that gives us everything on demand, almost like a replicator if you if you if you if you take out the economics of it. And and all of that is driven by seafarers, you know, struggling in the middle of the night to to get us our food and, and fuel safely. And I think it the whole industry deserves better, right? And and I don't think you can start getting better until you make the worst thing about the business side of it, which is this mess in email, um, a dramatically improved state. Sorry, that was a really big rant. Uh, I had a guest on recently who it was kind of a surprise. It came out in the in the interview of a podcast uh, with Barry Bednar. Uh, they said that, well, mm-hmm. I got kind of hurt a little bit by that because I had my supply for he he has a, a company that he runs that put injects um sodium bicarbonate into the into mm-hmm. the exhaust stream which then chem- chemically really cool. changes it it's a really interesting concept that's yeah. used on land totally blah 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 well so we start talking about the logistics and he said well i got caught sh- uh, you know short because they shut this trade lens i was using trade lens to figure out when yeah. i get myself <laughs> so you know here's a perfect example of exactly what you just said a lot of time effort and energy and brain power and money that went yeah. into that. That's now. I I think maybe there was a problem. Uh, there was a there's a few post post mortems which are pretty interesting. Written written about that. You know, uh, maybe they didn't have enough. Uh, you know, standardizations comes up. You know, everything's not standard. Yeah. 
uh, they maybe yeah. didn't have enough uh, deep domain experience, which is one thing that mm -hmm. is talked about a lot on this podcast that digitization, even if it's uh, AI, even if it's, um, you know, autonomous vessels, you need to have that that deep domain experience, whether it's literally a sailor sitting at shore kind of watching the maybe the autonomous ship or somebody yeah. reviewing a output from an AI or an output from an email platform. You need to have that kind of that yeah. lit litmus test. And I think that that's really the important part and, and what pay, maybe scares people off a little bit. Um, you know, as we kind of move along here, what, what do you see as the next kind of significant, I mean, you've been yeah. doing this for a while and you've been in this industry, yeah. in this space from the beginning. And I want to ask you a question about the beginning uh, after this, but you know, what is kind of on the the horizon? What 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 is kind of some of the next changes that we see? One of the things we talk about is a lot of collaboration. You guys do a lot of that. Yeah. Um, you know, standardization is a big buzzword. What, what, yeah. what do you kind of see in, in, in what you're looking at from your view? I, um, I'm going to, and, and, and uh, I'm just going to make one point because I think you touch on something that's really tricky with respect to innovation in our space. I believe that you can innovate innovate in the industry without deep domain expertise. I actually I I think I think this this is a this is privy to some place where where I don't always agree with with some of my uh, some of my competitors in the space. But what you must have is people involved who understand the market. And the reason that's important, some part of it, I don't think the founder necessarily has to be that. It isn't a matter of like figuring out the right way to write bill of lading. It's a matter of trust. Right. I continue to think the principal barrier to digitization is risk and it is risk mitigation. So so the very busy operator at seven o'clock at night, um, um, you know, there's a potential safety, life, uh, oil spill, financial risk. They have these hard formed habits that they're using to make sure that they don't miss things, because a lot of a lot of us in the market are quite self-taught. Right. And so I think part of having this background or understanding of the market means that, okay, I don't need a pair of glasses to look at this software. I, I can look at it and there's some words I understand and some understandings. And I think those people, there are people from outside the industry, people like yourself who can come into product management roles and can actually drive that innovation forward. So that's, that's one point. There is a part of me that thinks one of the reason our industry ran towards it was because the word consensus was used. And consensus, as you know, is a is a technical part of the blockchain where where to where the algorithm verifies its authenticity. I think it's entirely possible, and this is not this is not because our industry is stupid. I actually think that many people have been trying to fix oil trading, commodity trading for many years. They've been trying to deal with you know Argentinian um, grain specifications coming into American milling plants, you know, in the imperial, and they think consensus. Oh my God, the blockchain is going to solve this fundamental vocabulary problem. Right. I, I actually think this, I personally think at least halfway through, this drove the initial enamor with it, right? Hey, this is this is actually one of the big problems. And and so I, I think obviously that that you know you still need to define a language, um, a lingua franca for how companies are going to talk to each other, and the blockchain doesn't make that go away for you. So that pivots into your question. What do I think is next? I do think that we are, um, you know, I'm not going to say, hey, chat, GPT is going to get every, get rid of everything and AI, AI, AI. I've, I've worked in AI or I've worked around machine learning problems and shipping for a, a long time. Sedna has some aspects of, 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 of rudimentary or fairly sophisticated machine learning data extraction within it. I invested in, in an interesting startup around this. I think one of the things about maritime is as a physical reality it can be modeled in a data model you can actually you can actually track all the ships you could eventually track all the cargoes you could eventually track all the low parts the actual number of data points is is pales in comparison to what you need for consumer modeling or more sophisticated you know ai tools and stuff so i think that there probably is a significant moment coming in the next couple of years where the the relative cheapness of compute capacity the sort of situational awareness that we have of what's happening and moving in the world where those can be combined into both models and workflows that appear much smarter and and much more efficient and i think i think um going back to the lack of consensus between two counterparties, that is going to be fixed by AI or models like this. Like, hey, you're talking about 
50,000 barrels or, or, or imperial barrels, and I'm talking about 50,000 metric tons or, or, or whatever whatever you want to talk about. And the system can kind of figure that out without a committee needing to be to be formed to do it. I think this is coming and it's, it's starting to happen in, in quite significant ways. And by the way, to pitch Sedna, a great place to do that is in the billions of conversations we have around the emails of global trade, right? Um, where people talk in English about the same thing mostly time and again. And, and, and that's kind of that's one of the places that we're planting our flag one of the things that i think comes up and you touched upon this earlier no matter how we're kind of pivoting and stuff and you mentioned one of the earliest kind of technology companies that kind of came and gone in the early 2000s given your view kind of and i think it's a great holistic view of the industry certainly uh, on the tech side certainly coming from you know uh more of the the elemental the base kind of agent broker i mean that's the that's the you know part of the yeah. heart you know being a seafarer being a doc the agent these are all kind of where the rubber hits the road type jobs and then progressing into kind of solutions when you were at the precipice of flipping that over like you said 2000 everybody had a company and then it was a bubble and then you know a handful survived are we at a, are we at a bubble what do you think? Or do you think we have a little more runway? And and if we're not, or what's different? What's different between now and 2020, you know, 2000? There's a great book by Doc Searles, one of the kind of, you know, I think he might be at Harvard now, but he, he wrote a book called Small Bits Loosely Joined. And he talks about sort of the early foundational parts of the internet, right, from a post Netscape, from an information point of view, and that that the highest value in the network occurred at the furthest edges, and then the furthest edges were connected all the way back, not just to the center, but to each other. And I think... When I read this, I actually thought that's the shipping industry. Like, like to be fair, there are obviously some great, really big ship agents in the world. It's entirely possible that the best ship agent, I forgot to ask where he lived, might be might be one guy, right? And that one guy will get your ship in and out of port faster, right? And one of the beautiful things about the internet, one of the beautiful things that's happening as we kind of flatten the network um, in, in the shipping industry is that one guy can be given the same technology that the big company can get in order to deliver great service to Shell or Exxon or, or Chevron or those types of companies. So I think this is very important because I don't, I don't have any like data to prove it, but my instinct is that many shipping companies kind of break at a certain size, right? That the level of flat organizational structure, the coordination, right? As soon as you get too many offices, too many ships, of course, there's the outlier like Marisk and other stuff, but a lot of them, you know, and they, they, they sort of seem constrained. There's many, many small to mid-sized players across all different aspects of the market. And I think that that must be a function of efficiency and capital efficiency and, and making profit and stuff like that. And I think technology can supercharge that, right? And is part of all of those companies being successful. So that 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 for me, I think is is a very important way to think about it. Now, to take that into are we in a bubble? I th I think what's really important is that that's a physical need, right? There are real world people. Right now, there are people using our product, using Q88, doing something in South Africa to get the ship out faster or something like that. Those, those people actually need to take advantage of technology in order to be more efficient, in order to not be working until you know, 10 o'clock at night, that type of stuff. The market, market must serve them. And so when I think about, are we in a bubble? We're in a bubble if what you're trying to sell is like magic AI blockchain and we're going to get rid of people and, and you don't need to kind of face the fact that this is a physical business that requires human beings to do it really well. But if you if you are a realist and you think, just imagine the, you know, global trade is what, a $20, 30000000000000 trillion part of the global economy and, and all of the pieces that need to be coordinated and synchronized in order to do that exceptionally well, I think it's a vast addressable market of which there's plenty of time to sell stuff to. My own personal experience, obviously, as you know, we've raised money at Sedna. We've been growing you know, uh, uh, well over the last few years. Um, many in their early days, people didn't want to talk about email, didn't want to talk about shipping, didn't want to talk about the supply chain. Now I'm having a lot of really interesting investor discussions who really like that we have real customers with real problems, paying us real money, <laughs> the physical reality that most likely won't go away, you know. And and I think I think this is a moment. I do think there. I do think one question to be asked is in the bubble context. 
is is my business idea one that needs capital, venture capital to be very big, right? And and should I raise money at, at, at certain valuations to do that? I think that those are much different conversations. But I think our real world problem is going to benefit from the fact that maybe people's attention had been on many things that were a bit more ephemeral um, the last couple of years. I think it comes down to, you know, the the industry itself becoming a little bit more uh, willing and open, you know, before it was almost like, like you said before, a yeah. non-starter with trust. I think as you start yeah. to m- uh, migrate into a, a slightly younger workforce, uh, I think that's going to be a huge thing. I think yeah. also as you start to see, you know, companies like, we talked earlier about, like you know, traditional Greek ship owning companies like the Martinos family that's behind Signal. That signals, yeah. no yeah. pun intended, to their counterparts in Greece that it's okay to to invest in this, not necessarily to go on their platform, but to be mindful of that. And then you look at you mentioned Maersk. Well, they have you know yes. they have their platform with Zero North, and the, which is kind of tangential to the AP Moller Maersk yep. McKinney. Um, uh, you know, decarbonization. Uh, I believe the Offer family, they also yep. had some sort of uh incubator. Yep. You know, not only just looking at digital technology, but oh, yeah. we have a new coding for our ships to make it you know faster. So, th- th- I I think there's a little bit of a mindset. It may not the money may not all come outside from VC and PE type things type uh, sources. I personally think I think there's going to be a lot of, for a lack of a better term, self funding within the industry totally. but i do think i do I think i do think there's going to be uh, a little bit more of a runway even if the bubble burst you know we had a very small bubble uh, let's say a small to mid-sized bubble bubble in our industry back 20 yeah. 25 years ago so when that burst it just reduced it down to a smaller maybe slightly bigger than where we started i think even if it bursts now it, we're going to be exponentially further down the line you know and i think that this year particularly i've had a lot of a lot of views of people that companies, if they're maybe don't have as solid, what you said, business plan, or maybe it's too close to another one will be absorbed. And, and, and may, we may see a reduction like that rather than people just laying off everybody in the company. I think you're going to see absorption and especially around the ESG side is my personal opinion. Yeah. There, there is a large number of participants in the ESG side and and that I mean and uh, one can imagine an outsider's perspective right fuel is an enormous uh, amount of spend right it seems an area to to enhance on it, it, one one thing I find interesting about the three names you met and I have some familiarity with the tech stacks of each of them what continue what surprised me almost shocked me was the level of technical sophistication all three of those initiatives are pushing they are not like hey i'm just like i've got i'm like i got a corporate it development arm this they are doing some really impressive platform building at, at a highly technical level and i've and you're right like it's 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 the industry itself kind of building some real true software players. And it's quite impressive to see it's kind of just getting started. Yeah. You know, and I think again, not to no pun intended, it signals to their maybe more conservative counterparts that, well, if they, you know, if the offer family are doing it, you know, should we, it's a FOMO, yeah. right? It's a FOMO, maybe not even like you have to go out and hire 10 data scientists from MIT, but that you should have that. And then maybe just buy the software and say, okay, well, you then you build an IT platform, uh, an IT group, like you said, you know, to, for cyber, for this, for that. Yeah. Uh, you know, another one who's been a little bit uh, out ahead of the curve on on, uh, on the cyber security side, especially, has been uh, um, uh, uh, Liberty uh, in the U.S. You know, they have a whole, yeah. Uh, yeah. their yeah, yeah. C, C, COO, I think it is, Josh Shapiro, I've met a couple of times. You know, he's got a really good vision and, and it's, yeah. you know, it's a little bit of a niche business because they do a lot of government, but but he, he kind of has built out and been a little more sophisticated than, than let's say your average, uh, certainly average ship owner. Um, this has been a great conversation. As we wrap up, I like to, I like. To- I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no. One thing that that the challenge to scaling to fixing this is actually our industry doesn't know how to buy IT well. That's the real. That's the real. Uh, buy IT well and implement the change. I think that's the. You, you know, the, I hope that that's the next place they invest. Having now invested in actually building these platforms. Yeah, I I I think I think I think you're right. And and I think that that's going to be definitely uh part of the challenge among, you know, amongst other things. I think one of the things you go back to trust is who do I trust is going to 
you know, be looking after my interest. If I call with a problem that's software related, who's going to be that? And I think that that's, you yeah. know, that does bode well for companies and people who've been around a little bit longer. It certainly raises the uh, bar a little bit for newer companies, but you know, I think 2023, given yeah. all of these things, given kind of what's happening in the shipping markets, um, overall decent, maybe not as good as last year, what's happening with interest rates, we know it's going to be a, certainly an interesting one. Uh, as we wrap up here, I'd yeah. love to ask this question. What oh. are you reading? You mentioned one book, but is there anything on your bedside table that you're working on now? I'm a science fiction fan. So all all right. I'm reading uh, Adrian. Yeah, Adrian Tchaikovsky's book, uh, Children of Time. Which oh, is that the new one is, that just came out? Is, uh, that the, is that the second? The, the, second... The, the new one is Children of Ruin. So, okay. so Children of Time is the first one with, with the uh, with the ants and the and I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but but obviously it's it's about what would happen if you seed a world with uh, with a different set of DNA, but it doesn't go to the intended recipient. And but it really really clever clever storytelling. And uh, and I kind of stumbled across it actually, and and enjoy it quite a bit. We're going to wrap up. Thank you so much for coming on the on the podcast. We do appreciate it, and we look out for you know the many successes of of Sedna and your company. Thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. 